When discussing ethics, you will sometimes hear reference to your morality or my morality. But is there a difference between ethics and morality? And if so, are we using our terms in the most adequate and helpful way? Today I want us to ponder one question in general and a follow-up question in particular. What is ethics? And is there a difference between ethics and morality? Now philosophy is in the very business of grasping ideas as deeply as possible and communicating those concepts as explicitly as possible. And sometimes distinctions make all the difference. Sometimes a specific term is able to make explicit what other terms cannot. At other times, a term might be able to grasp a number of broad interrelated ideas, just as the term science may refer to a broad category of disciplinary studies, an approach to methodology in general, or measurable experimentation in particular. It may refer narrowly to fact in a more biased sense in which empirical observation is understood to hold a monopoly on truth and knowledge. Or it may refer more openly and rather simply to a study of the natural world. So to address the first of our two questions, ethics may similarly serve as synonym for the whole philosophical discipline known as moral philosophy in general. Or it might be applied more specifically to refer to a number of subtleties within ethical theory and application. The question of morality, on the other hand, will always be pressing us back into the assumptions, biases, or justifications which undergird our worldview foundations, our perspective, of the world. Let us first then understand these subdivisions of ethics as a broad discipline of study so that we may better ponder the distinctions and subtleties between ethics and morality. There are four branches of ethics as a systematized field of study, taken as an interdisciplinary whole. These include meta-ethics, normative ethics, applied ethics, and descriptive ethics. However, descriptive ethics is an aspect of sociology and not philosophy proper. That is, when you describe ethical practices of a given culture or context, you make no value critique or prescriptions. You simply report or describe what you observe. Moral philosophy, then, only includes three main subdivisions. Meta-ethics deals with issues of worldview, the language of moral philosophy, and the justifications given in support of the beliefs about the way the world is, beliefs which will necessarily imply options for the other two subdisciplines of moral philosophy. Normative ethics refers to theories of ethical action. How ought I to act in any circumstance, generally speaking. These include the view that one ought to act according to what is in one's own best interest, or one ought to act according to what results in the greatest happiness for the greatest number. One ought always to act according to a sense of duty or principle, or perhaps one's actions ought to reflect the sort of ideal or virtuous person which one aspires to become. Finally, applied ethics involves the inevitable, pragmatic, and political experiences that we face within any given situation within our daily lives. And it especially uses the horns of a dilemma, those difficult situations, in which the line between what's clearly right and clearly wrong is not so easily drawn, and shades of gray abound, to press us back into an examination of our normative theories and our meta-ethical justifications. So ethics can be used synonymously with moral philosophy, 
and moral philosophy refers to the philosophical reflection on any aspect of these various subdisciplinary distinctions. Understanding these distinctions concerning the discipline itself, let us now explore terminological distinctions within the discipline. Ethics may refer to the entire discipline of moral philosophy and the general question of morality, or it may serve a descriptive role, as we will address momentarily. In general, ethics, like moral philosophy, often refers to the critical evaluation of virtues, principles, values, and practices. Morality points us back to the question of that thing to which we refer when we speak of rightness, wrongness, goodness, evil, value, rights, justice, injustice, etc. Do these things even exist? How do you know? What worldview of reality best grounds or justifies our moral convictions? What does that imply for our ethics? How does the question, is there objective moral truth, impact the question, how should I live? But let us return to our initial prompt. Is it appropriate to say, my ethics, to speak of my morality, or my morals? Do these all mean the same thing, or different things? Well, moral comes from the Latin mores, and ethic comes from the Greek ethos. These are interchangeable terms, and in their origin they mean custom, that is, cultural precepts or practices. And this makes sense, right? Because before we ever began to philosophize about morality, we first have to notice that there are differences between cultures and contexts. So in its origins, ethics as a study was descriptive. We first uh, practice what we were taught to practice within the culture, then we begin to notice what we practice. When we see cultures that act very different, we notice the differences. So our understanding of ethics does begin with descriptive ethics, uh, namely comparison and contrast. But as we become more aware of the distinctions between rightness and wrongness, and goodness and badness, or what is or is not valuable. Whether that begins in our own culture, or whether it is once we are comparing and contrasting between cultural practices, and we begin to deliberate about whether we can both be correct, or whether one culture is superior in moral practices when compared to another. At that point, we are no longer digging at the descriptions of ethics, but we have begun to philosophize. And of what do we philosophize? We philosophize about the question of goodness, rightness, justice and injustice. What is moral truth? That is, morality. So it is adequate language. It is appropriate to speak of their ethics, or my morals, because these terms and their origins have to do with customs or customary practices. But it is a different thing to speak of morality. Morality comes from 14th century Old French and was generally used to reference moral qualities, as in the moral of a story, a moral teaching or instruction, or moral character which is associated with virtue. But it is important to understand that morality was derived from the Latin term moralis, meaning goodness. Note here that to ask what is the moral of a story is not to ask to what ethical practices did the characters adhere, or what ethical customs did the characters hold. Rather, to ask what is the moral of the story is to ask what understanding of moral truth and goodness am I meant to take away from this? What worldview is here being offered 
in justification of the good? What answer is given to the question of good and evil? We are not meant to take from Cinderella's story that when we face the problem of suffering and injustice at the hands of others, revenge is the best reaction and the path towards the good life. On the contrary, we are meant to take away that whatever happens to us and however other people may act toward us, we are called to be better people, to practice kindness, forgiveness, and to have fortitude, the strength to endure whatever we are going through. Have courage and be kind. So, returning to our disciplinary distinctions, in light of this distinction between ethics, or morals, and morality, descriptive ethics merely describes the actual ethical beliefs, customs of a given culture or group, whereas the other sub-disciplines of moral philosophy attempt to understand, to evaluate, to justify, or to critique various ethical practices the principles upon which the customs are built, and the moral foundations beneath those theories. Moral philosophy systematically presses sharply into our normative theories, socio-political disagreements, and situational dilemmas in order to drive us back to the deeper questions of morality, asking questions of rightness and wrongness, of freedom and responsibility, of permissibility and obligation, the quest for justification presses us onward toward moral foundations, questions of what is good or evil and why. This is the question of morality. Thus, I can speak about my beliefs about morality, my theories about what is right or wrong, my beliefs about moral truth, but I cannot speak of my morality and your morality so as to imply my moral truth and your moral truth. Because either there is a moral truth and it's true for everyone, or there is no moral truth and these terms, rightness and wrongness, what is ultimately tr morally true or not, good or not, just, unjust, these things don't mean anything at the end of the day if you can define yours and I can define mine. Applied ethics then focuses on particular moral controversies concerning various ethical practices. Normative ethics attempts to justify right action based on a particular view of morality with clear value prescriptions that dictate principles and actions Normative ethical theories attempt to justify what general course of action is right or wrong in most situations and why. But this is built upon meta-ethical presuppositions concerning value, what is valuable, and the nature of morality. Now, in this course, we will make a careful distinction. You may often hear the term telos or teleological in relation to ethics, but we need to understand this term and we need to be careful with this term. Many ethics professors and philosophers, sharp minds though they may be, use this term in an unhelpful way, in a way that closes off much of the dialogue that we need to have. Now, literally, the term means end or goal, but also, importantly, tied up within that is a sense of order or purpose. So some philosophers will lock on to the idea of an end and call uh, end-oriented or consequence-oriented ethics teleological. But when Aristotle used the term he envisioned much more than simply result. He used it to dig at the very question of order and purpose and the nature of a thing. And that's exactly how we need to be careful to use it as well. Because one of the biggest questions we could ask is whether there is order and purpose 
in the world or not? And the way you answer that question will bear great impact on your perspective of ethics. So teleological is sometimes in ethics courses used synonymously with consequential or ends-oriented. Egoism and utilitarianism are concerned only with consequences. It's not that an action is right or wrong, or that we ought to be a certain sort of person, but rather the end result or the consequence that results from the action is what determines whether or not it was morally right or wrong. Thus, they are ends-focused, consequential ethics, and so some people will use the term teleological ethics. But this is problematic. We will not use the term that way. We will refer to egoism and utilitarianism as consequentialist theories. The term telos or teleology or teleological, when used appropriately, should bring to mind notions of order and purpose and the question of whether the world is teleological. The teleological question concerns whether there is a grand order and with it a purpose for human life. A teleological world is one imbued with meaning and purpose and moral order. Now we said that normative ethics is concerned with justification of right action, prescribing how we ought to act. And so understandably there may be some overlap with questions of etiquette or law or even religious duties. Yet normative ethics is not necessarily the same thing as etiquette, law, or religion, though there may be some overlap. The problem of ethical terminology finds its way into the religious dialogue as the question of religion's connection to moral philosophy involves two questions, one of custom and one of grounding. What are the ethical teachings, expectations, customs, of belief group X. That's descriptive ethics. So sometimes in our ethics or maybe even in certain courses in the study of religion we might look at what people do or what people believe about how one ought to act. And so we're back to descriptive ethics or religious ethics. But sometimes we need to dig into deeper questions how are those moral beliefs grounded? How satisfactory is belief group X's explanation of morality? Upon what facts about the world is the moral teaching grounded? Are we appealing to divine revelation or natural revelation? That is, are we appealing to things that we only can know through scripture or things that we can know by the way the world is made, by the nature of the human mind, for example. So religious ethics might tell us about how people act or how they are taught to act. It may even appeal to grounding if it's descriptive. It may refer to uh, or describe the grounding or justifications given or the appeal to divine authority that's at play. But we can still ask, are the religious ethical customs good or bad, helpful, necessary, even just or unjust? And again, we are asking the deeper questions. Now we're back to philosophizing about morality. Here we might ask questions like, is morality even possible without God? Can you have a human right if the right wasn't given to a human by someone other than the human? So ethics is characterized by the grounding in human experience and reason. This question presses into whether there is a deep-seated moral intuition or conviction shared by all human beings, even non-religious people, that is necessarily grounded within God. What is the good? What is injustice without justice? What is a sense of justice without a sense of moral rightness or law? Next, we have the question of law and justice. Law's attempt to promote well-being and social harmony while resolving conflict. But are they good? 
Are they moral? Without denying legal authority, the study of ethics may deem some laws to be immoral. Some aspects of morality are not even addressed by law. For example, lying. Do we legislate against lying? Even if we don't, do we still think that we ought not to lie? Intention is important when considering the legal nature of an action. But bad intentions in themselves are not illegal, and yet they may nevertheless be immoral. Note that the ethics of any good social contract, that is our legal customs, may prescribe or delimit certain actions. Yet this alone does not mean that human law aligns correctly with moral law, nor that it is considerate of all that the moral law, that is morality, demands. So laws are normative. They prescribe how we ought to act. And yet, in many ways, laws themselves are an aspect of applied ethics because they are the application of our presumptions concerning normative theory, how we ought to act in general. A final distinction worth considering of custom and normativity is that of etiquette. Now, etiquette refers primarily to what is proper, polite, or the respectful, customary behavior. Although disregarding etiquette standards can, in some cases, be considered immoral. Here, we are again concerned immediately with ethics as custom. Ethical beliefs and practices, that is. But as soon as we ask whether the normative justifications for such customs are good or right, we have come back full circle to meta-ethics. So as I hope you see, the study of ethics or moral philosophy is deep and difficult and complex because we can break it into these different parts, but can we ever really study any one part alone? Because to dig at meta-ethics implies certain prescriptions as to what we ought to value, how we ought to inform our value hierarchies. It implies certain prescriptions for how we ought to align our normative theories. And it will impact, as it's worked out through our normative justifications, our applied ethics. Our normative theories our normative theories directly impact our applied ethics because the application in the applied is an application of our normative presumptions. And when the presumptions of our normative theories are applied, and yet the application does not work out so neatly, even worse, when it becomes clear that it's problematic, this forces us back to reevaluate the strength of our normative justifications. But to evaluate adequately, that is, deeply and thoroughly, the strength of our normative prescriptions is to ask questions about our meta-ethical justifications, to ask questions about whether or not we actually see the world rightly and understand morality correctly. While meta-ethics is the deepest of inquiry, applied ethics is the messiest. It is no simple thing to dive simply into applied analysis, yet without pressing into those normative questions and ultimately digging at the questions of moral grounding. Now, some courses in applied ethics may jump right into applied issues and spend the entire semester, the entire course, looking at the pro and contra positions within and across various issues. Yet, if we only speak of right actions without ever considering the differences in moral grounding, that is the worldview questions, behind the presumptions which inform our perspectives on right action, is it really likely that we will make much progress in our ethical debates, in our political debates? We may gain a wider perspective, able to consider a greater degree of nuances, sure, and there is certainly value in that. However, when we discuss right and wrong, much more is at stake than simply whether one's perspective has been expanded. 
What must be questioned is whether we see the world rightly. What reasons have we for thinking a given moral perspective to be correct? Why think that any given assertion about what is good is in fact good? These questions hit home and become more personal than one might at first think. Many people believe in human rights, for example. Do human beings have intrinsic value? Is there a sense of respect that really is due to all people simply because they are human beings? Maybe, but why think that? Can you ground and back up that claim? Many cannot. It is not enough to make a moral claim. We also need to back up our claims, giving reasons, forming an actual argument as opposed to a mere assertion is a start. Yet even this may not be enough. When we make the case that X is good, right, or permissible, or that Y is wrong, unjust or evil. When we point in this situation, applying our judgments concerning how one ought right now to act. We must also ground such notions upon the legs of normative ethics, our theories of how one ought to act in general, and meta-ethics, our foundation for the very ideals of just or unjust, good or bad, which claim to give obligatory force to our moral assertions. For this reason, a healthy understanding of the subject at hand, applied ethics, will not allow us simply to camp out on the pros and cons of applied issues all semester. The most rewarding study of ethics calls us to consider questions within each of these areas of ethical thought, meta-ethics, normative ethics, and applied ethics. And so we will move back and forth between these areas of investigation in this course. Moreover, the application of ethics is further complicated by the fact that moral perspectives apply themselves in a number of ways. Politics is an application of what one believes about the nature and purpose of government. And what one believes about rightness and wrongness, what one believes to be right in regard to the government's power, authority, and legislative function. Even the arts include applications of ethics. Stories, film for example, often present us with either an assertion of the way the world is or a thought experiment about the way the world could be or could have been. Possible worlds, we call them. Within that context, whether or not we agree, whether or not we even realize it, the audience or viewer is meant to see that world in a particular way and to associate goodness or its antithesis with a particular moral perspective. So we do need to discuss the applied. That is where we feel the force of morality most directly, most immediately and most powerfully. But what is being applied? It is our normative assumptions, our value theories, our presumptions concerning the way the world is, our presuppositions about the way the world ought to be. So inevitably, we find ourselves always digging back into meta-ethics. So, as we have learned, ethics proper contains many paradigm shifts. To see this better, consider the following example. Tribe X throws all deformed children to the hippopotamus because they believe the hippo to be the god of the river, and they worship the hippo, and they believe that all deformed children are the property of the hippo, and so they give what is due to the one to whom they believe it is due. Now so far, we've, we've just been engaging in descriptive ethics. I described their custom to you. But let's analyze it. What is the prescription? That's the constant, that's what they do. But what is the prescription? This action is morally obligatory. It is the right thing to do. It is the thing they have to do to throw the deformed children to the hippopotamus. That's the applied, the application of their normative belief. What is the moral justification? The normative principle at play here is deontological or duty-based ethics. The tribe believes the children to be the property of the hippo, and so they have a duty 
to give the children back to the hippopotamus. Now, within that normative principle, that normative prescription, we have a meta-ethical foundation, a grounding, a moral principle. This is all built on a foundational view of justice, that justice entails giving to each one his or her due. Now, the reasoning for their actions is built upon both a moral principle and non-moral beliefs. So the moral principle is a foundational sense of justice, that justice entails giving to each one his or her due. And then they have a non-moral belief that the hippo is a river god, as well as a non-moral belief that deformed children are the hippo's property. Because they believe the hippo is a god, and because they believe the deformed children are the property of the hippo, their moral principle that you ought to give the property that is due, to whom it is due, gives obligatory force to their moral practice. Now, some people are quick to be taken aback by differences, and they'll look over here at this culture, and they'll compare it with another, and they'll say, well, they believe this is right, and they believe that's right. Clearly, they're different, so there is no moral truth. Truth is relative to each group. However, notice with our scenario here, we may very well disagree with the tribe. We may call their actions not only wrong, but heinous. But notice that it's non-moral beliefs when coupled with a common moral principle that accounts for wide variety of customs. Whether one's ethics, that is their customs or morals, are in fact moral, whether or not they line up with morality, will depend on whether one's beliefs about reality actually correspond to the way things are. So notice that we actually agree with the tribe. Most of us do. You might say, what? I don't agree with any of that. Oh, but you probably do. We disagree in our politics all the time over what is just and what is right and who has rights. And in all of that disagreement, we agree that if something is due to someone, then justice entails giving to each one his or her due. That is a foundational moral principle with which we all agree. Where we differ is what is actually due and to whom it is due. And notice from our scenario here that that is informed by non-moral beliefs. So it's the non-moral beliefs when coupled with the moral principles that uh, creates the, the wide variety in our customary practices. So we do differ. We do see differences between culture, but it's not because there is no moral truth. It's because we've got a lot of beliefs in there to unpack, and some of us may see the world more rightly than others. So ethics and morality are not the same thing, although they are significantly and necessarily intertwined terms. What makes this distinction difficult is that both terms can be used in a variety of ways. And moreover, people often use them in careless and presumptuous ways. When people speak of a group's morality or your morality, as in, well, that's just your morality, but who are you to tell me how I should live? They're speaking either out of presumption or else carelessness and confusion, or perhaps ignorance. In actuality, they either mean your morals, that is, your convictions concerning ethical practices in general, which we said may be understood as synonymous with ethics in the sense of custom, or they are presuming that there is no such thing as objective, universal moral truth, and so your views on the question of morality can never really refer to anything beyond your own private feelings. Your morality equals your private beliefs. If, however, your view of morality actually corresponds to the nature of reality, then it is not your morality. It is binding on everyone. In this case, someone might correctly challenge your understanding or justifications concerning morality, but to equivocate morality with custom is to misrepresent and presuppose the question of morality. Okay, I want to cover just a few more terminological distinctions and considerations. 
as we begin this course in ethics, and I want to conclude with some benefits of studying moral philosophy. In his text on ethical theory, philosopher Lewis Poyman observes that although there is no universal agreement on the traits a moral principle must have, there is a wide consensus about five features. First is prescriptivity. Moral principles are generally formulated as commands or imperatives. Do not kill. Love your neighbor. A moral principle necessarily entails a prescription. And if the prescription is well-grounded, it presents an obligatory force. We sense that we ought to do that thing prescribed, or we ought to be that way as prescribed. Second, universalizability refers to the fact that moral principles must apply to all people everywhere who are in a relatively similar situation. According to overridingness, moral principles have predominant authority over other kinds of principles. If a law requires an immoral act, then civil disobedience, that is refusing to adhere to the law, may be morally justified because the moral rightness of refusing to follow an unjust law overrides any obligatory force that the law itself may hold or claim. Next, moral principles are public. Publicity is the idea that when we prescribe something, we expect everyone to comply. Now, in many ways, this is obvious. Yet, in a day in which many people speak of your truth and my truth, as if morality is just a subjective experience, it is worth pointing out that if prescriptions were secret or subjective, there would be no force beyond each individual. Finally, a moral principle must have practicability. It must be able to be applied. If something is impossible for me to do, can it really be the case that it is also morally obligatory for me to do? Now, morality may often entail ideals or things for which we should aim, being a certain sort of person, for example. But ideals entail perfection, but as I am, I am not morally perfect. So is morality meant to help get me there or to burden me by showing me all that I am not in my moral imperfections. Maybe both. Maybe it's in realizing where I fall short that I am driven to become something better, to make better choices. The point is that if something is impossible, then it cannot be obligatory. It may still be ideal, something for which we aim, though. For example, it might be desirable for morality to require more selfless behavior from us, but it would be impossible for a human being to never act out of self-interest. So a moral law that prescribed do not ever act out of self-interest and always act out of interest for another person might burden us and overwhelm us with a deep sense of moral guilt and despair because we are never able to keep that kind of law. We might be able to act selflessly in some times, but to keep a law that says never act selflessly would be overwhelming for us. So while there might still be moral ideals at play for which we should aim, ideals involved in our character development, the moral principles involved in the judgment of our actions as right or wrong, moral or immoral, have to be practical. There are four domains of ethical assessment, that is, if we're going to evaluate whether or not an action was moral or immoral, we've got to consider a few different things. The first is action. What should we consider in regard to the nature of the act itself? A second is consequence. 
Did it result in something good or something bad? Are we talking about an act that is generally considered wrong and yet it resulted in some good? So do we consider you immoral for doing a wrong thing that led to a good? Or would it have been better to do the right thing, the expected duty, even if no good comes from it? So here we're considering the nature of the consequence. We also might consider the nature of the character. If two people do the same thing and their actions and the results of their actions seem fine, yet if we had insight into the sort of people they are, and one of them, generally speaking, thinks about other people's well-being and wants the best for them, but the other person, generally speaking, wants bad things for other people or finds pleasure when other people fail or get in trouble or suffer. We don't see it in the action or the consequence, but would we still be justified in calling the one person better morally than the other person? In saying that the latter example, that there's something wrong with them? So here we are evaluating the nature of the character. And finally, if we have information about the action, the consequence, maybe even the character generally speaking, we might need to consider at times the motive behind the action. If someone was found at the scene of a crime, a murder, and claims to be innocent, we should consider at least the motivations that they give for having gone to this person's house, and we should also consider at least the possible motivations that they might have had for committing the crime. Now, when we talk about the nature of an action, we may need to distinguish between an action being obligatory, permissible, forbidden, or even supererogatory. So an obligatory action means that I have an obligation. If I'm morally obligated to do something, it is a duty. That is what I have to do. Not to do that is to be immoral. On the other hand, if it is forbidden, then to do that which is forbidden is to be immoral. But sometimes things may be neither. They're not forbidden, nor are they required. They're permissible. If everyone puts their pants on one leg at a time, as the old saying goes, ought we to put in our left leg first and then our right, or vice versa? Of course, we know that is a silly question, and the reason is because it is neither obligatory to do this nor forbidden, it doesn't matter. It is permissible. If you want to put your left leg in first, that's permissible. If you want to put your right leg in first, that is permissible. So for many courses, you may be obligated to take and pass an exam, or you may be obligated to complete and submit a term paper if you want to complete the course. You also may be forbidden to cheat off someone else's paper. Or with the term paper, you may be forbidden to plagiarize someone else's work. However, it may be, depending on the course, depending on the test, it may be permissible in some cases to use an open textbook to aid you. Even if you can't look on your friend's paper, you can still look in the textbook. That is permissible on some tests, though forbidden on others. Similarly, on your term paper, while it is forbidden to plagiarize, it is permissible to quote some good ideas that other people have had, as long as you are attributing the quotes and citing them correctly. Finally, some acts may be called supererogatory. In this case, we don't have a duty, but we do sense that it is good. So when you go above and beyond duty, this is called supererogatory. The poor, the homeless, orphans and widows. Yet, if you cannot do that, you're not punished for that because it's not morally obligatory that you have to go out of your way or give up what little bit of money you have for another, although we do think that is good and we champion that. So because we think it's good, yet we don't think it's obligatory, there may not be a sense of duty 
associated with the act, but there is a sense of goodness associated with it. So we will not be punished if we refrain from acting in that way, yet we may be praised or rewarded or appreciated if we do, and we may not. So, in closing, what are the benefits of moral philosophy? The study of ethics can free us from prejudice and dogmatism as we learn to explore the nuances. And while everything does not reduce to perspective, it is important to be able to expand our horizon of perspectives so that we can see things more clearly, see things from other people's point of view. You will be able to build a much stronger case for your own perspectives once you learn how to build well and charitably the case for perspectives with which you disagree. The study of moral philosophy can help us to think more clearly and deeply about moral issues. It reveals how principles and values relate to one another and to our worldviews, to our perspectives, our beliefs about reality. Finally, the study of moral philosophy can deepen our appreciation for the great conversation of our own Western heritage, while equipping us with the dialogical tools necessary for extending that conversation globally, and the practical tools of discernment necessary for building our own communities locally. Welcome to Ethics.